Hello, my name is Doug Moore. I'm the executive director for the Oregon League of Conservation Voters. I want to thank you um, all for attending and welcome you to this virtual town hall with Congresswoman Suzanne Bonamici. Uh, today, we're going to talk about our once in a generation opportunity for significant investments in clean energy, justice, and jobs. Um, we are recording this town hall meeting, um, so if you miss something or have a technological glitch, you'll have a chance uh, once it is posted online to see Congresswoman Bonamici's responses. Um, to get us started uh, this afternoon, I'd like to begin with our land acknowledgement. The Oregon League of Conservation Voters works to protect people and places on the ancestral lands of the indigenous communities who built homes, economies, and trading routes across the land we now call Oregon. We would like to honor and acknowledge Oregon's nine federally recognized tribes who have stewarded these lands since time immemorial. The Klamath tribe of the Southern Oregon Plateau, the Burns Paiute of the high desert mountain east, the Coquille of Southern Oregon's coastal forests, the Confederated tribes of Grand Ronde in the Northern Coast Range, the Cow Creek Band of Umpqua in the Southern Oregon foothills, the Confederated Tribes of Umatilla in the Blue Mountains, the Confederated Tribes of Siletz in Oregon's Northern Rainforests, the Confederated Tribes of Coos, Lower Umpqua, and Syslaw on the windblown Southern Coast, and the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs on the sunny Eastern slopes of the Oregon Cascades. And we would like to recognize all other indigenous communities who have not been federally recognized. Oregon was built on broken treaties, and the lasting effects of federal and state policies, both past and present, have put Native Americans at a disadvantage for hundreds of years. It is on all of us, whether we are descendants of colonizers or inhabitants of stolen lands, to re-educate ourselves and each other. Together, we have the responsibility to push past recognition and demand land repatriation and reparations to sovereign tribal nations and indigenous people across the state. OLCD works to work, aims to work in partnership with tribes to further this endeavor of land repatriation and reparations. And now, um, switching gears, please let me introduce uh, our friend, Congresswoman Suzanne Von Amici. She is someone we all know really well. Um, she, I have a special place in my heart for you, Congresswoman. Um, right after I took over as OLCV executive director, I had just moved to Oregon for this job. Um, you were deeply engaged in the special election for uh, Oregon's first district. It was the first political activity I work on, and I remember it very fondly. Um, and you won that race in early 2012 and have represented Oregon's first congressional district since. Um, you are a fantastic climate uh, champion. She has a very, really consistent and impressive lifetime LCP score of 98%. And from her time in the Oregon legislature, uh, Congresswoman Bonamici has an OLCV score of 98%. Um, she serves on the House Select Committee on the Climate Crisis, where she has been a leader in getting Congress to act on climate. Please welcome Congresswoman Suzanne Bonamici. Thank you so much, Doug. Can everybody hear me okay? Can you hear me all right? We're having a little technical difficulty there, Congresswoman. We can't hear you. Can now can you hear me? Hello? Now can you hear me? Okay, terrific. Um, not my first time on Zoom, so I don't know what's happening today, but thank you so much, Doug, for that very kind introduction. I very, I very much appreciate it. And thanks to everybody for joining us for this town hall meeting. Everybody at OLCV, thank you for being such champions for climate action and for conservation. I have to say, this really needs to be an all hands on deck effort. We know the science is clear to prevent the worst effects of the climate crisis, we need to make progress at every level, local, state, and federal, and comprehensive climate action can't happen without everyone involved. So Oregon is a leader, your advocacy is key, and will continue to be key. So I wanna start by acknowledging what we all know. These are extremely challenging times. The global pandemic has taken hundreds of thousands of lives uh, in the United States and millions around the globe. 
caused a severe economic recession and further exposed deep and ongoing systemic racism and inequities. And in Oregon, we've recently witnessed several extreme weather events that have claimed lives and destroyed communities. Remember the Labor Day fires last year, the ice storm last winter, the deadly heat dome just this past summer. Now, 2021 certainly emphasized that the climate, climate crisis has become what we already knew, an undeniable part of our daily lives. So in times like this, we can draw strength from the reasons why we began this work in the first place. So I wanna start by taking a step back and telling you about the roots of my commitment to climate action. So it, it, a lot of it has to do with my mom. Who, she passed away last year, but she continues to be an inspiration. Um, she was almost 92 and for my whole life, uh, she was always ahead of her time. She started a recycling club back in the 1960s. She grew a large and beautiful organic garden before most people knew what that was. She played the piano and painted modern art and she marched for civil rights and taught me to speak out and take action when there's injustice. So in the mid 1970s, I traveled with some friends from Michigan where I grew up to Oregon. Uh, didn't take me too long to fall in love with the state. It happened to be blackberry season and that helped a lot. Um, so I ended up in Eugene and I went to Lane Community College and then the University of Oregon for my undergraduate degree and my law degree. And as a student, I was working at Legal Aid, helping low income clients who were struggling, not by choice, but by circumstance. And I realized that many families were just a car accident or a late fee away from economic disaster. And I think back to that work, and I know right now frontline communities in the climate crisis are really facing very similar experiences. And so our efforts to address the climate crisis will not only help these families by creating good paying high quality jobs, but also by doing what's right for future generations. So after law school, I worked as an attorney doing consumer protection in Washington DC and Portland. Uh, and then when I came back to Oregon, I, I became a mom to two wonderful children who are now wonderful adults. And I have to say that parenting really reaffirmed my commitment to wanting to preserve the planet, not just for my own children and the grandchildren I hope to have someday, uh, but really for future generations and for humankind. And so as a policymaker, the question I always ask myself, will this legislation, will this policy create a better future for the people I'm honored to represent. So speaking of honored, I was really honored when Speaker Pelosi asked me to serve on the House Select Committee on the Climate Crisis. I'm the only member from the Pacific Northwest. Last Congress, we were charged with producing a bold and science-based comprehensive plan to address the climate crisis. And for more than a year, we had hearings and roundtable discussions and briefings with stakeholders from Oregon and around the country. And we had a process to inform our work. And then we released a formal request for information. We received more than 700 substantive responses from people across, the, across Oregon uh, and the United States and many in the Pacific Northwest. So our final climate action plan, which is available online, uh, sets our nation on a path to reach net zero emissions no later than mid-century and net negative thereafter. The plan, all 500 plus pages of it, is divided into 12 pillars that consist of building blocks of recommendations. And I want to note that environmental justice and the needs of workers are core elements of the plan and woven throughout. So collectively, the 12 pillars uh, form a meaningful set of policies to accelerate our transition to a 100% clean energy economy, focus on the needs of frontline communities, and importantly, create good paying jobs. So I also serve on the Education and Labor Committee, Science, Space, and Technology Committee, and I co-chair the House Oceans Caucus and Congressional Estuary Caucus. So in light of those leadership positions, I've been leading the charge on crafting our recommendations relating to workforce and labor, the ocean. And I've also participated uh, deeply in the environmental justice, resilience and climate science provisions. So our plan for solving the climate crisis focuses on addressing the root problem and it needs to, carbon emissions. But we also recognize that the climate crisis is already here and it's exacerbated racial disparities and economic, economic inequities. So the plan addresses the urgent need as well for adaptation and resilience policies, but we know that's not enough. 
I have to note um, at this point that it's encouraging to once again have a president who believes in climate change and climate science after four years, of, four long years, I might add, of defending science and the environment from a disastrous Trump administration, we finally have the opportunity and in fact imperative to achieve comprehensive climate action at the federal level. So addressing climate change, I want to say, should not be a partisan issue. If you think back to the, a lot of the original environmental laws, they were, they were bipartisan and often signed by Republican presidents. But for many reasons, like the filibuster, for example, uh, and Democrats who represent fossil fuel dependent states, it's been challenging to get bold action through both the House and the Senate. But I do want to note that there is a sense of urgency really highlighted uh, when you think about the alarm, the recent report from the Intergovernmental Pan Panel on Climate Change, that was an alarm. Uh, we simply must advance meaningful climate action this Congress. And I plan to join Speaker Pelosi and my colleagues from the Select Committee at the UN Climate Change Conference, or the COP, COP26 in Glasgow. Uh, that's next month in November. And as one of the vice presidents of the conference from the Netherlands recently said in DC in a meeting, a, pl a planning meeting for the COP, if we don't take action now, our children and grandchildren will be at war over food and water. Pretty clear way to state it. So climate action, as I mentioned, requires that we work together at every level of government. So as I work to build momentum and pass policy at the federal level, it's also important that you keep the pressure on our state and local governments to do their part. Also, there, it's public and private sector as well. Everyone needs to take part. And together, we can protect our planet, accelerate that transition to a clean energy economy, create those good paying jobs, support a just transition, combat environmental racism, and build more resilient communities. We can build back better. That wasn't an original phrase. I borrowed that from uh, President Biden, but it really is true. Uh, as we rebuild our economy post pandemic, we're not gonna build back to where we were before. We're gonna build back better. So I appreciate the opportunity to talk with you today. I'm glad to be your partner at the federal level for climate action. And I'm looking forward to the questions and conversations. I'm gonna turn it back over to Doug. Thanks, Congresswoman. Um, speaking of Build Back Better, um, can you talk a little bit more about the importance of some of those investments in that $3.5 trillion proposal? Because there's a lot of really good stuff in there. And, and just this is a great opportunity, instead of talking about numbers, for us to really yeah. focus on what this can mean for Oregonians. Absolutely. And you're right. We shouldn't be talking about numbers. We should be talking about what the legislation does and what's in it. Uh, speaking of numbers, uh, the 3.5 trillion that people are talking about, that's over 10 years. I just want to note that that's a heck of a lot more than we spend on the Pentagon budget. So uh, just to, to, put, to, to make it clear, we are talking about a once in a generation opportunity to com combat climate change and strengthen the foundations of middle class prosperity, which is a really important part of it. I want to note that um, th this doesn't have an additional cost. So pe people are saying it's going to add to the deficit are not correct because it's paid for by requiring corporations and wealthiest individuals to pay their fair share in taxes. So it won't raise taxes on anyone making less than $400,000 annually. And in fact, and in many ways, is going to improve their lives and lower costs. So there's many important components of the bill that touch in every sector of the economy. Renewable energy incentives, drought funding, a clean electricity payment program, uh, the EV rebates, child nutrition, tuition-free community college, affordable childcare, universal pre-K. So some of my top priorities um, in the climate area are the workforce development funding and also coastal restoration funding. Uh, the house's portion includes about nine and a half billion dollars for funding coastal restoration and ocean data and monitoring. Priority will be given to shovel ready projects that will rapidly put people back to work while also restoring ecosystems that sequester carbon dioxide, which preserve biodiversity and increase resilience to extreme weather events. And that's something we desperately need uh, in our coastal communities, not just in Oregon, but around the country. And then with regard to workforce funding, I just wanna emphasize again, how important this funding is, not just for economic development, but as we address the climate crisis. So I've been speaking with experts 
our labor secretary, Secretary Walsh, and have been calling for $100 billion in workforce development funding. So the House's portion includes about $80 billion for workforce development because we know we can't build the clean energy workforce we need without this investment. It's also a critical part of making good clean energy jobs available to underrepresented communities and those who are transitioning out of fossil fuel jobs. So it's a very, very important component of that, uh, of the plan. So I, I mentioned the clean electricity uh, program to bring the rest of the country basically up to Oregon's standard. Uh, it's a modified clean energy standard. There's grants to power providers that increase uh, clean generation at least 4% each year. Uh, there'll be a fine for those that don't. Uh, fortunately, uh, most natural gas and coal do not count as clean. Uh, and I, th I think clean coal is an oxymoron. Um, and there's significant funding for grid improvements as well that will help us transition to renewables, energy efficiency, particularly in low income communities and, and EVs in low income communities. So a lot of exciting provisions in there. Very excited to be working on them uh, with all of you. Well, I know um, I want to ask one more question because I think this is top of mind for just about everybody. Uh, obviously, we're all fingers crossed that we can get this over the finish line. But um, with everything changing every day, every 15 minutes, what is the latest news from Washington, D.C.? Well, the latest news, and I just got off of a, another a Zoom recently with uh, de the Democratic Women and the Office of Management and Budget about priorities. So on, ongoing negotiations at President excuse me, at present, the senators, the White House and House leadership uh, are continuing to negotiate. Um, some have been advocating, I wanna note for the House to immediately pass the bipartisan infrastructure bill that passed the Senate. Many of us have raised concerns about that approach because although it does have some good investments in transit and passenger rail and drinking water, EV infrastructure, um, it doesn't do enough. It doesn't reduce emissions. Uh, so on Friday, and just a few days ago, uh, President Biden came to the House and let us know he wants us to pass both bills together, not just the infrastructure bill. So uh, as of today, negotiations are ongoing. I know that many have been expressing their priorities. The House has taken each committee's portions and put them together in a bill. Um, and with so much at stake, I just want to say failure is not an option. And I know that uh, we are doing all we can to get this over the finish line. And I'm very hopeful as we prepare for this UN climate change conference in November that we can go to the conference and report that we've taken this bold action. I'm sure that would be um, a fantastic feeling to uh, go to Glasgow and be able to say that to the rest of the world. So hopefully we'll we'll get there. Um, we so too. Yeah, Let, let's switch gears um, and take some questions uh, from the audience. Great. Um, first up, we have Marion uh, Dresner, uh, followed by Donna Mabry. Um, and I, before you go, Marion, I just want to thank everybody who's joined us. We have a ton of people who are watching from all across. Congressional District 1 and from the rest of the state as well. And it's really um, just fantastic that we have such a massive interest in this bill um, and that everybody is really paying attention and continuing to take action. Uh, and we need that to get this over the finish line. So thank you for that. And Marion, take it away. Hi, Marion. Oh, hi there, Congresswoman. Um, thank you for all the work you do on our behalf. Um, I, I'm Marion Dresner. I live outside of Newburgh, Oregon. And yes, I know about the school board situation. Um, I'm very concerned about climate change. I'm a retired professor and a writer. And I read the paper and I understand what's in the infrastructure bill and the Build Back Better um, budget resolution. There's a lot of important provisions. So, um, well, like Doug just said, I wanna know what's gonna get watered down or cut um, because I read about the two senators and, um, and uh, I don't know, you know, what's going to wind up on the cutting room floor. I, you don't, you can't read the future, but will climate remain um, a top priority in these negotiations? Thank you. Thank you, Th thank you Mary. And, and uh, 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 thank you for your involvement and in, in your advocacy and your question. Uh, from every conversation that I have had, uh, and I know the House Democratic Caucus as well as the Senate. You know, 
many, most, I should say, most of us agree uh, that climate needs to be a, a, a priority and I'm gonna do everything I can. I know the Progressive Caucus has climate as a priority. Many individual members do as well. We just can't afford to lose this opportunity. So um, I also wanna note that it, it, from, if you just read the headlines, it looks like you know Democrats are really fighting, but most Democrats are all on the same page. So the public perception I think is that many people actually deny the climate crisis, but actually it's really a small minority. Um, in fact, the Yale program on climate change communications found only about 10%. Uh, are, people are still deniers. Um, unfortunately, there may, may be a little bit higher uh, percentage in, in Congress, but uh, I have to say that though many of my colleagues still deny or ignore the climate crisis, I've seen many uh, of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle increasingly come to terms with the reality of climate change, and we're not expecting them to support the reconciliation. They said that they won't, but I want to say that that um, it, it there's been a significant change where we're seeing, for example, people who are representing districts where farmers are suffering from unreliable crop yields or severe hurricanes or droughts or fires. Um, and I've had conversations with, with people here in Oregon in the agriculture industry. They're very, very concerned about, about the drought. So the bigger, bigger issue right now is the difference in how we want to resolve the crisis. So I know it's, it's going to be critical to keep this as a priority. And I think what's really, really encouraging is that it's the priority of the administration. So knowing that, um, that, that almost everyone in the House Democratic Caucus and the Senate Democrats um, have climate as a priority is, is critical. Uh, so we'll continue the conversations. Uh, I, I, I don't think the House is the issue. A certain senator um, from a certain coal dependent state, but I have to say, from my conversations with, uh, with people lately, th there's a recognition. Uh, we have a, a member from West Virginia on the House Committee on the Climate Crisis, and she understands, people understand that there needs to be a transition. They just want to make sure people have a job in their community. So I'm going to do, again, everything I can to, to make sure that uh, climate stays a priority and build back better and to continue. You know, we are with the reconciliation or with build back better. Uh, there are some things that we just can't do because of rules. So we're going to continue to work to implement our, our uh, climate action plan as well. So thank you, Marion. I wish I had a working crystal ball. I'll tell you how it was going to turn out. Me too. Thank you, Marion. Uh, next up, we have uh, Donna Mabry. And after that, we'll have uh, Juan David Alonzo Garcia. Hello, Representative. Bonham. Hi, Donna. Thank you so much for, for joining us today. Um, I've already yeah. learned so much. So I'm Donna Mybori. I'm from Beaverton, and um, I'm a climate activist with LLCB, um, is my, my main group that I work with. Um, the question is, do you perceive any reduction in government support and services, excuse me, government support and subsidies for fossil fuel industries? Uh, absolutely. <laughs> and I, I think we're, we're seeing as we're watching what's happening in, in California right now, we're seeing a huge concern about fossil fuel industries. So I, I really applaud the steps that the uh, Biden-Harris administration has taken so far, including pausing new oil and gas leases on public lands and offshore waters. Um, I've been supporting a sort of polluter pays climate fund that would require the largest uh, fossil fuel companies to pay for their past emissions. Mm -hmm. So we absolutely need to do what we can during this transition. I, I also support President Biden's call to end fossil fuel subsidies. According to the International Monetary Fund, the U.S. government ranks second in the world of its support for oil and gas industries, which is absolutely the wrong direction to go. It's a bad deal for American tax taxpayers, especially for those who live in the areas of oil and gas uh, production, uh, where we need to be uh, incentivizing increases in production is in renewables. And I absolutely would do all I can uh, in the Build Back Better Act and through the Climate Action Plan to end the fossil fuel subsidies and to make sure we are growing and expanding our renewable energy industries. I've been very excited about the uh, wave energy research happening off the coast of, of Oregon. So mm -hmm. lot, lots of potential there. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
your question, Donna. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Thank you, Donna. Um, next up, we have Juan David. Hello. Hi, can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, my name is Juan David Alonso Garcia. I am uh, from Hillsborough, Oregon, um, here in Oregon. And thank you so much for your time, uh, Rev. Congresswoman. <clears throat> what are your priorities to solve climate change and how does the Build Back, Build Back Better Act help these priorities? Well, thank you, Juan. I really appreciate it, Juan David. Um, thank you for your question and for your involvement. Well, the top priority is to reduce emissions. That is my top priority to solving the climate crisis. And I'll refer you to the Climate Action Plan, which I mentioned, which is available. I don't know if, if my staff is on, my, my wonderful staff, Allie, maybe or Jenna can add that link to the chat, but you can look through there at the, the many uh, pillars, the 12 pillars that include our recommendations for solving the climate crisis. And I mentioned in my opening remarks, the, the areas that I focused on, the ocean, ocean health, you know, ocean covers most of the planet. A uh, healthy ocean uh, means a healthy planet. So, and, and also the labor and workforce provisions, environmental justice, resilience, climate science. Uh, and, and again, really want to emphasize that workforce piece. The goal is to put people to work uh, and to make sure that they have an opportunity to skill up to get the good jobs that will be available uh, as we transition to a um, clean energy economy. My, my grandfather was an immigrant from Italy, and he was a coal miner uh, in Pennsylvania. And he, he lost his leg in the, in the coal mine and then uh, died of lung cancer. So we, we know that we need to transition to a clean energy economy and make sure people who are working in those, those industries have uh, a, a way to, to get a good paying job. And I, recently I visited um, in Columbia County, which is in the, the district I represent, uh, Portland Community College has this wonderful job training center for people to learn advanced manufacturing, for example. We need models like that across the country. I'm working on a national economic transition legislation. So we're really targeting those job opportunities and the path to get those skills uh, in the hardest hit communities. So we, we're also working on apprenticeships and, and just ways to provide workers with the support services they need while they're skilling up to get these great jobs. So that's what a just transition is about. Uh, and it's a, a really big part of our transition to a clean energy economy is, is making sure that, that um, those who have historically been left behind for those good job opportunities, whether they be women or people of color can have that opportunity. And I'll tell you, I've, set, I've been around a table with uh, people who have been through apprenticeships, for example, and they've said, you know, I don't know what I do without this, this opportunity to get skills, to get a good job. So that's why these provisions are so important to build back better, because the jobs that will be available in clean energy economy and, build, and building the infrastructure, because we know we need to do that as well. And infrastructure doesn't just mean roads and bridges. It means uh, you know, grid and charging stations and broadband and clean water systems. We're going to need a lot of people to do that work. And we just don't want the, those jobs going to the people who have traditionally had jobs in the trades. We want those good jobs to be available to, to everyone. Uh, so, so those are, are my, my priorities, that, that the, the emissions, but also all the pieces that go with that transition to, to clean renewable energy. Thanks for your question. Thank you. Um, that was a great question. Um, next up, we have uh, Randall Olson. Good afternoon, Congresswoman Valamichi, and thank you for your work in fighting the climate crisis. My name is Randall Olson, and I live in King City, and I manage the Energy Conservation Program at Community Action Organization in Hillsborough. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you touched briefly on this earlier, but my question is, how do you envision electrifying America, and what is the time frame? That's a great question, Randall, and thank you for your work. I'm really excited about electrification. I, I've driven hybrid cars for, for quite some time. I, I got my first Prius a really long time ago and had another one, and then I, I finally just uh, just got all electric, and I have to tell you that uh, 
it's awesome. A little learning curve, you know, just different planning, but certainly well worth it. So we know the transportation sector is the, the largest or one of the largest sources um, of um, carbon dioxide emissions in the country. And we know that vulnerable communities are disproportionately affected by it. So our climate action plan has a national standard to achieve 100% sales of zero emission cars by 2035 and heavy duty trucks by 2040. I, I want to note um, that uh, I grew up, as I mentioned, in Michigan, just outside of Detroit. And I have to tell you that to see the, the automakers like General Motors announce that they are going to all electric was was really inspirational. I mean, I, I never thought as being a Michi originally a Michigander that I would see that day, but I'm thrilled that that uh, we're starting to see that transition. But we also need to make sure um, that we have the, the infrastructure for zero emission vehicles. We have to double funding for public transit, which I'm um, working on as we look on at the infrastructure bill. Um, there's funding for transit, for rail. Um, we have to have a R&D for low carbon fuel standard to help accelerate for medium and heavy duty vehicles. Uh, look at our ports, our shipping vessels and our airplanes. I got to ride an electric school bus recently, which the Beaverton School District has. It was It's great. It doesn't smell bad like most buses do. Uh, and it's quiet, which is refreshing to the driver and the students. Um, we also have to make sure though that EV uh, opportunities are uh, and are accessible uh, to more low income people mm -hmm. and and there is a, a big gap there currently. So the infrastructure bill will help build a whole network of EV chargers to accelerate that uh, adoption of electric vehicles. Uh, recently had a conversation with an ambulance company that's researching converting their ambulances to electric and there's also um, an exciting section of the Build Back Better plan that came from our House Oversight Committee is uh, electrifying our postal fleet uh, with a, a provision to include charging infrastructure at post office lots, parking lots. So there's a lot of efforts being made. I'm concerned about, for example, um, people living in apartment buildings or people who don't mm -hmm. have a garage. So we have to have that charging infrastructure there to close that equity gap. But there's a lot of potential and I'm very excited about it. And we're seeing I think here uh, in Oregon, the, even the, the, the infrastructure increasing, but we need to do that across the country uh, for, for EV infrastructure. And then, and then also the, just the, the, the uh, credits and incentives to, to lower the cost. But obviously as more and more companies start um, manufacturing electric vehicles, we're gonna see the cost uh, being driven down. So uh, very exciting potential out there. And I thank you for your work, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Randall. Um, next up, we have Michael Mitten, uh, followed by uh, Jan Gwynn. Thank you, Michael. Hi, Michael. Good afternoon, Congresswoman. My name is Michael Mitten. And I live in Northwest Portland. I'm uh, part of the uh, Metro Climate Action Team, uh, which is sponsored by uh, OLCV. My question is, what can we do to accelerate the offshore wind energy opportunity for Oregon? Our state is home to one of the best offshore wind areas in the world for generating electricity. Developing this natural resource has the potential to mitigate the climate crisis more than any other single action we can take. It could also revitalize our coastal economies and put them on a sustainable path to the future. NREL, the National Renewable Energy Lab has estimated Oregon's offshore wind resource is 62 gigawatts, which is more than the total current generating capacity of the entire state. Biden administration has set a goal to deploy 30 gigawatts of offshore wind this decade, employing 44,000 workers. The East Coast has 30 gigawatts already in development pipeline, but the West Coast is still trying to get started. So that's my question. Thanks for taking it. It's a great one, Michael, and I very much appreciate it. I know the East Coast has been ahead there, but we, we also know that offshore wind has a tremendous potential uh, to rapidly uh, decarbonize the electricity sector. And as you mentioned, create thousands of good paying jobs in manufacturing and construction, installation, operations, maintenance, 
uh, just just a tremendous amount of potential. And there's a, a an, another reason why we we need all this uh, workforce to 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 get people uh, ready for those great jobs. So what I think what we need to do here in Oregon is really look at the su uh, successes and challenges of offshore wind development on the East Coast. You know, understanding that our coastlines are different, but taking the lessons learned and applying those to make sure that first of all that all the stakeholders are able to have input into the Bureau of Ocean Energy uh, Management, the BOEM leasing and permitting decisions. And, and that's really important uh, to have that input from, from stakeholders. Uh, you know, a lot of people have, we, you know, we have, we have tourism and we have commercial fishing, we need to have their input, but we also need to recognize that the climate crisis is affecting those industries as well. So California uh, is gonna be the first state on the West Coast to hold the lease auction. So they're gonna have to use uh, floating wind technology in, instead of the sort of conventional fixed bottom turbines. It's not as fully developed. Uh, we have to, to really look at how we can uh, look at the Department of Interior, Department of Energy, support our national labs, leverage public-private partnerships, and, and really have the R&D research and development that we need to improve that floating wind technology. And, and I just want to mention too, how refreshing it is to have Secretary Holland and Secretary Granholm uh, leading those agencies after four years of the Trump administration, where we we didn't even have a confirmed no administrator during the entire Trump administration. But uh, so so back to, to to wind energy, we we know that the if we do the research and development, we can figure out how to improve efficiency of the turbines. We can mitigate wildlife effects, grow the domestic supply chain. Uh, so we also have to make sure that BOEM, the, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management and National Marine Fisheries Services are adequately funded to do this work. We have to support continued extensions of the offshore, offshore wind investment tax credit, which I support. And again, as I mentioned, listen to the, the stakeholders, our tribes, environmental stakeholders, commercial fishing industry, ports, they need to be around the table and I know they will be. So. Uh, it's my understanding that BOEM and Oregon have already had several meetings to discuss the prospect of offshore wind on the West Coast and to consi and consider those uh, this input of stakeholders. So I'm monitoring those conversations. So I do want to mention too that I've been a long time champion for wave energy. Uh, we uh, ha have been able to secure $109 million in the spending bill last December. PacWave, which is working here with Oregon State University. I, I say proudly as a, as a duck that I very much support the work that OSU is doing in wave energy with the Pacific Marine Energy Center. This is a real success story. They have the first FERC license uh, off the coast of Oregon, and it's going to be the first grid-connected wave energy test facility deployed on American shores for you know, real-world testing and evaluation. So I'm very excited about this opportunity. I mentioned speaking with uh, somebody from the EU uh, planning for the Conference of Parties uh, from the Netherlands. And we know that many EU countries are ahead of us with, with the research in, in marine energy. So the, the Oregonians I've spoken with who are working on this project are very, very excited. I got to go to Northwest uh, Portland to see the buoy, the very large wave buoy that was built right here in Northwest Portland uh, at the sh uh, bigger shipyard. They, again, another job opportunity is they build that wave buoy and then took it out to Hawaii to test. Uh, lots of potential from marine energy as well as uh, offshore wind. So there's so many uh, possibilities for us as we transition, and many of them are happening right here in Oregon. So it was a great question, Michael. Really appreciate it. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Michael. Um, next up, we have uh, Jan Gwynn, followed by uh, with Robin Lindsley. Thank Jan? you. Jan? Hi, Jan. Jan, we can't hear you yet. You're muted. Okay. Can you now hear me? Now I can hear you. Yes. Now okay. We can hear you. Sorry. No worries. My name is Janice Gwynn. I live in King City. And um, I have a question about the Ocean Caucus that you are a member of. I'm not really sure what they are focusing on, but I am a scuba diver. I have 
dove all over the world, both locally and internationally. And I have seen areas of cor coral that used to be gorgeous, but are blanched with water temperatures. So I was just wondering what the ocean caucus had plans for or, or if they're even addressing it. Thank you, Jan, Janice, for that question, which is so important. Yes, the Oceans Caucus is a group of members, bipartisan group of members of Congress who care about ocean issues and ocean acidification, marine debris, illegal fishing. Those are all some of the issues that we're working on. And I have seen, as you have, I haven't seen them as up close and personal as you have, but certainly uh, the, the tragic changes to, to the ocean, to ocean health and the species uh, that inhabit it, uh, like our coral reefs, for example, the best way to pre prevent future deterioration is to stop the cause, which is the warming ocean temperatures and rising emissions, because we know that uh, the, the uh, acidification and hypoxia, those are all coming from the fact that the ocean is absorbing uh, a lot of the carbon emissions. So this is exactly the kind of work that the House Oceans Caucus is working on. I have a piece of bipartisan, two pieces of bipartisan legislation, blue carbon for our planet. And I got this idea visiting the scientists at the Hatfield Marine Science Center. And they were talking about how blue carbon ecosystems can help store significant amounts of carbon in the context of mitigating ocean acidification. So there is a tremendous potential here in protecting uh, the ocean, uh, uh, absorbing carbon emissions uh, and restoring ecosystems. There's certain is kelps and mangroves and seagrasses uh, that act as a carbon sink. So it could prevent uh, approximately a gigaton of carbon dioxide from entering the atmosphere by 2050. So um, the Blue Carbon for Our Planet Act, which I mentioned is bipartisan, will help map, protect, and restore those blue carbon ecosystems. And then I also have the Blue Globe Act, which is also bipartisan. And this is to assess the, the need for an advanced research project to, to um, uh, explore and the creation and deployment of ocean technologies that could help us better understand how to, how to adapt to, to climate change. And the way we look at this is that, you know, we, we don't know a lot about the ocean. We still need to know more. And this is gonna strengthen innovation efforts to expand data and monitoring and technologies. So uh, the UN Decade of Ocean Science is coming up and the, the intent is to map uh, the ocean floor. Uh, so we need to know more about the ecosystem. The more we learn, the better we can protect it. So I've also called for robust federal investments in coastal restoration and resilience, which I mentioned, ocean data monitoring. Uh, I've been working on the ocean acidification and how for harmful algal blooms, hypoxia, um, and the coastal restoration that we've called for $10 billion bipartisan with the Republican co-chair Don Young, who represents the entire state of Alaska. So there's a lot of ocean uh, to be concerned about there. Um, this would create good jobs while restoring a really valuable, uh, vital ecosystem. So I, I just want to mention that how fortunate we are as well to have a partner at NOAA now with Dr. Rick Spinrad, who's our, our new NOAA administrator, who comes to uh, uh, to Noah from Oregon State University and uh, really appreciates the importance of all of this work, uh, as I know you do, Janice. So thank you for the great question. Uh, reducing emissions is the most important thing we can do, but all the other pieces with addressing ocean acidification and uh, blue carbon and hypoxia and algal blooms, it's, it's all related. So thank you. Thank great. you. Of course. Thanks, Jen. Um, next up, we have Robin Lindsley, um, followed by Beverly Burke. Hello, Robin. Hi, I'm starting video. It says starting. Unmute. Hi. Okay. I see you. Unmute. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Yes. Great. Okay. I'm from uh, Forest Grove. And so outside Portland here uh, in a rural and um, urban connecting place, we're doing our best to grow food. And we're feeding a lot more hungry people than we were. Uh, right now we're in line to be taking uh, surplus food from after the farmer's markets, just from Forest Grove 
close to 3,500 pounds of food that, um, that we've collected from like five or six farmers out here, which is extremely generous of them. Um, the surplus food is feeding twice as many people in the emergency box lines that are coming to some of the uh, pantries here in Forest Grove. And we started a garden as well um, because we couldn't do our plant sale uh, because of COVID. So we took all those little baby plants and put them in the ground and grew food last year as well to take uh, to the pantries. My question mostly has to do with how are we going to include people who are doing small things like growing food in um, green energy jobs because we don't really stand out a lot. We don't use a lot of mechanical stuff. We grow things in the ground with our hands and we're doing a good job, but I don't see a lot of publicity. I did have a real encouragement this year because Forest Grove has these small community enhancement project grants. Every single person on that, uh, mostly city councilors uh, on that group, that committee gave us some points towards our little grant to have hoop houses, which we did build one already. Um, and that's one way to extend our growing season, but that was a lot of work by hand. And so I know that there's gonna be uh, jobs that we're gonna wanna, um, uh, paid jobs that we're gonna be, want to be able to uh, share with people. Is there anything going on that you know about that focuses on that uh, seemingly small kind of idea? Oh, Robin, thank you. And it's, it's, very, very important issue, food, food production and, and how we feed people on this planet. Absolutely. And it's, and that work is affected by the climate crisis, as you know, I, I got to visit a, a great farm up in um, uh, near Astoria, uh, North 46 farm where they're, they're pioneering all these dry farming techniques. And there's a yeah. lot of great work uh, going on now. Um, and, and thank you for all you're doing in the community there in Forest Grove and in that area. Um, it, it's so, so critical, um, but we also have to, to look at agriculture as part of the solution. Um, it is. Yeah, being effective, but also part of the solution. You know, there, food waste is an issue. Um, thank you for, for working with, you know, making sure that we aren't wasting food. Um, there's, there's a lot of food waste. Uh, we're just working on a, a bipartisan school food recovery act to reduce Good. food waste at schools. Uh, but also, I think what's really important and the important part of your question is making sure that we're supporting local farmers, uh, no matter the size of the farm, um, our small local farmers have to get through really tough times. So I've always been a, a big supporter of farmers markets, local suppliers. You're also reducing uh, emissions intensive transportation by, by keeping right. food local, which is really important. So we have to continue to do what we can within existing national food regimes to reduce emissions. I'm a huge fan of the farm to school programs, for example. Yep. I work on, on the education committee where we work on child nutrition issues. Like this is a win-win, right? We're gonna get healthier food to our students. We're gonna keep it local and we're gonna support the local farmers. So more programs like that that we have are, are important. Uh, we have to make sure that industrial manufacturers are, that we have to make the farming equipment more environmentally friendly. Yeah. Electrifying the transportation sector to cut transportation emissions as food is shipped. Um, and I mentioned the sort of no-till, conservation tillage, all those uh, things that are being done to help with reducing carbon emissions and improving water retention. Mm -hmm. But you know, in terms of just su supporting farmers and, and individuals, I mean, many are considered small business owners. Mm -hmm. It's been really, really tough during the pandemic for so, so many small businesses, but making sure that we have all of these programs that help. I, I do wanna note too that uh, there's a couple of things in the Build Back Better plan that are really going to help everybody. And that's number one, affordable, ch accessible childcare. Because right now, there's so many people who, predominantly women, but not exclusively women, who can't go to work because they don't have childcare. That was true during the pandemic. And they, if they don't have a safe place for their child, they're not going to be able to go to work. So affordable, accessible childcare. The other, and I know that not all farmers have uh, you know, degrees in, in agriculture, but 
tuition-free community college, making sure that those who want that, that education uh, can, can get that without worrying about financing. Uh, universal pre-K uh, for, for kids to get a good start so that as they're going through school, we're actually spending less in support services. So there's a lot in that bill that, are, that, that is really gonna help equalize um, the opportunity and reduce costs for, for working families. And finally, I can't not mention the child tax credit which we passed, um, that's, that's so far um, set to reduce, reduce job poverty, cut job poverty in half. Uh, huge um, issue for, for the economy. So all of these things, even though not directly related to farming, relate to work and families. And so it, it's all gonna make a difference. But thank you, Robin, for that work that you're doing in Forest Grove, really important. Um, I miss my mom's giant organic garden, uh, uh, which, I, which I always loved uh, helping her with, but, uh, but maybe, yeah. some, maybe someday I'll have one. Well, I, don't want to, I don't want to forget to give a pitch for school gardening because Absolutely. that's a lot of things together. Absolutely. You mentioned. Yeah, I, I, visited, I visited schools that have gardens. Uh, Rachel Carlson, Carson Middle School, um, they have a great garden. They're, they're located close to the uh, Oregon Food Bank uh, facility out in Beaverton. And, yes. uh, and, and I've seen firsthand when kids grow food, they're more inclined to eat it yeah. when they watch it grow. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so that, that's all good too. So yeah. um, absolutely agree with you uh, on Thank that. You. So thanks, Robin. Thank you. So thank you so much for your work and for taking of course, thank you. time to talk to all of us. There's of a lot course. of issues here. There thank are. You. Thanks, Robin. Thanks, Robin. Um, next up is uh, Beverly Burke. Um, and we hopefully will have time for two more questions, but this might be the last one. We'll try and see if we can squeeze one more in. Thank Hi, you, Beverly. Beverly. Hi, Representative Bonamici. I have to say that um, I feel better just having you represent me. And I oh, do it's very kind. Thank you. Um, also, to the previous caller, I just want to make a shout out. And I'm in Tigard. My little grade school, Mary Woodward, also has a beautiful, beautiful school garden that is, just gives me a lot of joy just going through there. Um, I probably had a previous question for you, but I have been pretty um, down over the last few days about the lack of action that you know we as Democrats are able to bring forward by the um, recalcitrance of some of our own party and certainly by the opposite side. And so for all the things you've talked about doing, which I know you're doing and trying to do as well as you possibly can, I want to know if you see any small, because I think it would have to be small um, cohorts of Democrats trying to work with Republicans to get them to make this vote, to try to produce more action. Um, it's the lack of action that is very disheartening. Th thank you for that question, Beverly. Um, I have, I mean, since my time in Congress, which has now been hard to believe, almost 10 years, nine and a half, almost 10 years, um, I, I learned a lot, I have to say, from my years in the minority, uh, including the value of finding common ground. And I never felt like, oh, I just got elected to get things done when I was in the majority, because there were many years when I wasn't. Um, and it is, I have to say, I mentioned the bipartisan Blue Globe and the bipartisan um, uh, ocean acidification and various bills. Um, we in significantly increase the chances of bills getting through both chambers and being signed into law when they're bipartisan. That being said, we cannot sacrifice our values and have to keep working on this, this uh, Build Back Better plan. I do not expect Republicans to vote for it. Um, that means we need all 50 senators uh, and, a, and, a, and a majority of, of a Democrat, almost all of the Democrats in the House. So I do know that there are ongoing conversations. You know, now that we have a Democratic president, a Democratic House, and a Democratic Senate, I've spoken with Senator Merkley recently. I speak with Representative Jayapal on a regular basis about the Senate negotiations. I know that people are working on this. So, uh, you know, no, as I mentioned, no Republicans have, have indicated they will vote for it. I don't even expect more than a handful of House Republicans to vote for the bipartisan infrastructure bill, um, because sadly, there are many who just want to make it look like Democrats can't get things done, which is really unfortunate. However, I also want to say that this is 
where we are right now at this moment in time with the what we've seen with drought, with extreme weather events, with the recent intergovernmental panel report, this is code red. Uh, I think back to when Jim Hansen, James Hansen first testified uh, about climate change. He's a NASA scientist. He testified back in 1988. Think if we had taken action then, if he had heeded his call in 1988, what a difference it would have made. So um, my, I just please don't give up hope. Uh, we're going to get this done. We're going to get as much as we can in through this um, Build Back Better plan. And then we're going to continue to work on our, our um, climate action plan and all of the policies uh, that, are, that are in that climate action plan as well. And, and again, it, at, at the risk of sounding like a broken record, um, which may be an obsolete term because people don't listen to records anymore. Um, the, the workforce piece is really important. Sending that message that people will have jobs as we transition to a clean energy economy is really important. Please let me finish by saying that the, the Republicans who really strategize know that by keeping Democrats from doing anything at all, you lose your power. You, Mr. Biden has gotten so much power from just what he has given to the American people in his short five, six, seven months. And so any actions that we can pass to give put things in people's pockets, jobs in their, in their queue, um, anything gives more power to the people, more power to Democrats, and really weakens these very difficult people who seem so uninterested in governing. I appreciate that, Beverly. And it really is about uh, as I mentioned early on, it really is about, will this policy create a better future for the people I represent? That's, that's the frame that I put on pieces of legislation. And that's why I so strongly support taking bold climate action uh, in the Build Back Better plan. And, and because of rules, as I mentioned, we can't fit everything in there, uh, but we're gonna continue to work on our climate action plan because it will truly build a better future. So thank you for your question. Thank you so much. Thank you, Beverly. We have time for just one last question here. Uh, Tim Miller is up. Hi, Tim. Hi, Congresswoman Bonamici. Thank you so much for this time to discuss climate change. Uh, my name is Tim Miller, and I use he him pronouns, and I'm the director of Oregon Business for Climate. It's a, an you. alliance of businesses that all agree that strong action on climate change is both an imperative and an opportunity for Oregon in our economy and our economic development. So as you know, there are many businesses throughout the state who want to see aggressive action on climate change, and they know it affects their businesses and that it can create lots of opportunities. The full $3.5 trillion Build Back Better investment is critical to this. And so here's my question. Aside from sort of the obvious climate-related businesses, um, what do you think are some of the more surprising, smaller, or more rural businesses that will see opportunities as we invest in this transform transformation toward a clean economy? Thank you for that question, Tim. I, I, don't, I know we don't have much time, but I could spend a lot of time talking about that. But thank you for your work. I really see this clean energy transformation as a way to uh, it, restore rural economies as well and provide uh, small businesses with lots of opportunities. Like Just look at Wave Energy, which I mentioned, mentioned for example. They'll need a supply chain, specialized installation vessels. Um, look at solar energy. We need um, to increase collaboration for land activity. Are we going to co-locate with animal grazing or agriculture with solar panels? And 99% of wind farms are in rural communities as well. There's a supply chain for that as well. As we're increasing investment in energy efficiency for homes, that's a lot of jobs. HVAC systems, electric appliances that are installed and maintained. Uh, so those workforce development funds are going to make sure, again, that the small businesses and rural communities reap the full benefits. Um, I was just out in uh, rural Yamhill County looking at a, uh, a cell tower where they're um, installing more broadband uh, opportunity, which isn't directly related to the climate crisis, but all of these rural opportunities help a lot. So I, I mentioned the community college industry partnerships that are part uh, of the, the workforce piece, great opportunities for community colleges, uh, many serving rural communities uh, for on the job training and education opportunities. So rural communities stand to lose a lot or gain a lot. 
uh, depending on what we do to strengthen that that resilience. So uh, climate action, and I'm glad that President Biden says this, when I think climate action, I think jobs. Um, and then I did mention the other pieces as well that will be mutually beneficial to people in rural communities as well as urban and suburban communities, affordable childcare, the child tax credit, tuition free community college, that's going to help everyone. And I think my message is, um, we all do better when we all do better. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks for your advocacy. Thanks, Tim. Uh, and uh, we're out of time for questions. I want to really thank you, Congresswoman, for um, your generous time today and for answering questions and turn it back over to you to for any closing thoughts you might have. Well, just thank you for the opportunity to, to speak with you. I, 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 of course, prefer to meet in person, but uh, for now, we're, we'll, we'll have to be uh, virtual. But I, I very much appreciate uh, not only the opportunity today, but your ongoing advocacy. People in, in elected office respond to the people who they represent. So what you're doing across uh, the first congressional district as well as across the state is really making a difference. So thank you to OLCV, of course, nationally to the League of Conservation Voters uh, for your ongoing advocacy. Tell your stories. It really does make a difference uh, and, and stay in touch. Thank you, everybody and take care. Thank you, Congresswoman Bonamici. We really appreciate it. Um, before everybody leaves, um, would like to turn this over for just a second to um, OLCV's organizing manager, Brittany Van Sitters, who is joining us uh, to talk a little bit about how you can stay active and engaged on Build Back Better. Thanks, Doug. And thank you so much, Congresswoman Bonamici. And thank you all for being with us today. Um, right now, as you just heard, is a really important time to make sure that the Build Back Better Act really includes the bold climate action and environmental justice policies that we need. And luckily, we have great climate champs in Congresswoman Bonamici and both of our senators, uh, Wyden and Merkley, but it is still important for Congress to hear from us, even if it is just to say thank you for the work that you're doing. Um, so I want to tell you um, how you can help the Build Back Better Act stay strong and actually get to President Biden's desk. Um, so first, uh, please like OLCV's Facebook post and add a comment to thank the Congresswoman for spending her time with us today um, and uh, for her climate leadership. The link to our post is coming into the chat soon. Um, so please head there right after this and add your thanks. Um, we will also have posts up on Instagram and Twitter if you're active on those platforms. Um, and then at this time, really the best thing that you can do is write a letter to the editor, to your local newspaper, or uh, it's also known as a, an LTE. Uh, these are really short 100 to 300 word opinion pieces where you can share your thoughts with elected officials, your community, or even the whole state. Um, and it's a chance for members of the public to just make their voice heard. And they help demonstrate the broad public support for bold climate action. And they can help uh, champions like Congresswoman Bonamici convince their colleagues that Congress needs to prioritize clean energy, justice, and jobs in the Build Back Better Act. Um, LTEs are also a great tool to publicly thank our climate champions and reassure them that voters have their back, while also adding pressure to some of the more moderate elected leaders to do the right thing. So uh, we really can't let this once in a generation opportunity pass us by and the clock is ticking. So um, I will... Um, post a link to the toolkit that OLCV staff have prepared um, to help you um, in the process of writing a letter to the editor. Um, OLCV staff are also here and available to answer questions, help with editing, proofreading, um, anything that you need, we can help you do it. Um, so that link is going in here now. And, um, you know, even though most of Oregon's congressional delegation is on board with the Build Back Better Act priorities, it's still important to make sure that your support is known for everyone to see. Um, so please um, take the, if you have the time, please take it, write a quick letter to the editor. And like I said, we're happy to help. Um, and again, thank you all so much for joining us today uh, for our climate town hall with Congresswoman Bonamici. And um, thank yeah, you, Brittany. That's all I got. Have a great week.
Uh, thank you um, as well to everyone who joined us today. And of course, to Congresswoman Bonamici. Um, for all of you, we really appreciate your engagement and your leadership on climate and your actions. Um, and just a reminder, this is our last best hope for action on climate. And if we aren't able to move significant legislation this year, we might never have a chance like this again. So please stay involved, stay engaged, and let's help um, Congresswoman Bonamici and our senators get this over the finish line. Uh, one final note before we close for today, if you, we, we didn't have enough time to get to everyone's questions. Um, and if you, uh, your question was not answered, we are going to share those questions with Congresswoman Bonamici's office and they'll do their best to get you an answer from the Congresswoman. So finally, uh, again, thank you everyone for attending and we at OLCV look forward to working with you uh, to take action on climate and to uh, pass the Build Back Better Act for America. Thank you.